Julie Bowman. I'm coordinator of academic programs here at Osher Lifelong Learning Institute in Jupiter. Welcome to uh, this afternoon's lecture. Uh, this is going to be exciting. We have a lot of wonderful, um, wonderful items for you uh, to take a look at. I hope that you've had an opportunity to take a peek at what we have up here. If you have not, uh, please do take a moment after the lecture to go ahead and come up and take a look at some of the items that Dr. Wyron has, uh, has brought for us today. Um, I'd like to ask that you take a moment and silence your cell phones before we get started with the lecture. And at this time, I would like to take a quick moment and thank John and Patricia McGowan for their generous sponsorship of this program. Hey. They are longtime members of OSHA Lifelong Learning. We are delighted uh, to have them be a part of this program. Um, it's a privilege to be able to work with them. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome John McGowan. He's a member of our advisory board here at OSHA LLI and Jupiter. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Good afternoon. Welcome. This is our final lecture in the health and wellness series for this year. And this lecture deals in part with physical activity, which all of us need. And this particular one being golf. Our speaker today is a golfer. You might have seen him play as he was a collegiate conference champion. He made the cut in the U.S. Senior Golf Champ Open Championship. He's played professionally in Europe and Japan. He won the South Florida Long Drive Championship with a 381-yard drive with a wooden-headed driver, winning by 50 yards. It was at the airport. <laughs> uh, he's an author, so you may have uh, read one of his, or more, of his 200 articles or 14 books. He authored the PGA Teaching Manual, a 619-page work that is arguably the most influential golf instruction manual. He served the PGA of America over 13 years in several capacities, including education director, director of club activities, and director of learning and research. He's a teacher, having taught golf in 32 countries and in Japan for 17 years. Although he hesitates to try to teach me to play golf, I think it's the old dog new trick thing or something. He was the founder of the professional golf management program at 19 universities, a founding member of the Golf Collectors Society. You'll see some of this up here. He created the PGA World Golf Academy, PGA Discovery School, PGA slash USGA uh, rules and workshops, and the Colonel R. Otto Press Historical Golf Library. From high school in Omaha, Nebraska, he went to Huron University in South Dakota, then to the University of Michigan for a master's degree, where he also coached football then to the University of Oregon for a PhD in sports science. He and his wife, I own, who is here with us today, wife of 56 years. They right have uh, four children, one of whom is here doing some videoing today. Uh, they live in North Palm Beach, and he is currently the Senior Director of Instruction for all golf, all Trump golf properties. Join me in wel welcoming my friend, Barry White. Thank you. I have a friend in Omaha named Warren, uh, last name Buffett, and uh, he was uh, going, invited down to University of Nebraska uh, to uh, give a lecture. And he was the first one up there, so he got the microphone like I am to right now. And he said, testing, one million, two million, three million. <laughs> a little different approach. But uh, I do want to give sincere thanks to the people that make this 
possible. You just met John and Pat, were you? You're here somewhere? Yeah, right there. Thank you very much for making this possible for, for us to be here. Wendy Geller was in here earlier, and Wendy, uh, again, she did all the things that had to be done to get us here. Mahood, Mahood, where are you? Back there. Cassier, hey, it's close, right? <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, my, my son, Dane, a wife I own, we're going on 58 years, and uh, that's my thanks, and then to you, for all of you for coming, because of lifelong learning. I own and I were walking in Copenhagen. I was doing a thing over for the Danish golf team, and I'm part Danish, anyhow. And uh, so uh, we're walking in a beautiful park. So it's kind of one of the things that was uh, one of the prints of Denmark or so. And I see this woman sitting in the, there was these huge bushes, and then there would be a little cutaway, and she was sitting at a bench. Elderly woman looked to be well past 80 maybe. And uh, we're walking along and we see this lady and I said, oh, it was a relatively nice day, even though it was not the best season in, of, to do walking. And I said, how are you doing? She said, oh, fine, in English. And I said, uh, and she's got this big book in front of her. And I said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm doing some teaching uh, to adult people at classes, like kind of like this. And she said, I had a question the other day about early man, and I didn't know the answer. And so I'm studying to catch up on this, and she was 92. <laughs> so lifelong learning. I think it's a wonderful concept, and I'm so glad that you're taking part in it. Uh, I'm uh, from Omaha, as I mentioned. I grew up, started playing golf when I was 10. Uh, I started working at a little golf course where I was playing called Spring Lake Park. 1,864 yards long, nine holes, it was a monster. And uh, the uh, nice part of it was I got a job there at age 12, a hydration engineer, which meant uh, that I was the night water boy <laughs> who went and take, got the, right by the greens, you get the big uh, sprinklers that look old like this and I get up on the green and get them around and then go later and change them around that so, so at age 12 I was already in the business of uh, working and uh, but that with particular golf course no putting green no driving range no water hazards no bunkers no rough it was the minimalistic bottom of the barrel and it was a great place to start because it helps you appreciate all that you may have had a chance to do after that so that's a little bit of background, and I'm going to now start our program. Well, we take a look at the history of golf. And uh, this is geared toward being, doing, getting three things done. First of all, we want it to be educational. We want you to see things, you, you play golf or you know golf, that you've never seen before or heard stories you've never heard about. In, in, in as far as this game is concerned. So educational. Secondly, motivational. I want you to be able to, to be able to take some of these examples that we give up here, particularly the ones related to health and fitness, and take those home with you. And not only take them home, but make them change some of the patterns that you may be in, or make them the ones you're in even better. And finally, it's going to be hopefully entertaining. There's, we, like to, we like to have laughs, a lot of fun. Now, the first 14 books that I wrote, the very first book, which was a, which was a good say, went 125,000 copies, so that was a good start. But the first line, the very first line I ever wrote said, golf is a game, and as such, is meant to be enjoyed. So we always are going to have, I like to do things with people when we have lots of fun. Give you two quick examples. When I uh, am down at Trump International, people say, Gary, you're 82 years old. When are you going to retire? I said, what would I do? Go play golf? No, <laughs> that's what I'm doing right now. And so uh, when people come and a guy, I meet a guy and I say, well, what's your name, sir? He's a new person there. And he says, uh, Strapasi. Oh, I said, very nice. Oh, I wanted to ask you a question. 
I said, uh, where, where did your uh, grandparents come from? And I hold up this nice little beautiful thing of the, of the country of Italy, see, like this. So where, what part of Italy did they come from? Well, right away, I've made a friend, you see. There's nobody prouder of their heritage than Italian people, and they love that idea. So we have a little fun with that. Right away, you make a, a good impression, and you've got a friend to start with. And then we do things fun on the golf course. So for example, I'll say, uh, I'll get a putt. I'll be out there playing with somebody and have a putt that's tough, like 20 footer, break six feet, that's something like that, and I say, fast. You know, uh, I, th I feel good about this putt. I think I can make it. I, bet, I, I got a five dollar bill that says I can make this putt. And they look at me and I said, do you want to bet or not? And they know, there are no your odds are 10 to one at least, so yeah, I'll take the bet. So I putt and I miss. And then what do I say? I take this out of my billfold, a five dollar bill, what does it say on that five dollar bill? I can make this putt. I said I had a five dollar bill that said I can make this putt. So I win. <laughs> so the important part, what's the important part? Have fun. Have a fun out there. And it's not too easy because golf will give you a certain amount of disappointment and frustration. Right? Yes. Right? Yes, yes. yes. But misery is a choice. Got it? So you know, get over the little things that aren't. Uh, hey, every time we're doing anything in life, we want to do it well. And golf just doesn't let you do that every time. And when you look at the paper and you see a guy shoot PGA Tour, 64 the first day, second day not quite as good, third day not so good, 78 the last day. That is a big spread, 14 strokes. What would you do if you shot 14 strokes higher than your last round? Tell me, oh, geez, I'm ready to call it commit Harry Perry. But that is the way it is, and you have to accept it. So here we go. We got some things to say about the game of golf. So let's pick this up, make it happen. <coughs> Well, historically, uh, actually, there were probably the first people that played a stick and ball game. We were about stick and ball games. Probably was in China in the Song Dynasty, 966. It started, I think, and ended in 1284. The Song Chinese Dynasty for the, that country. But they were so far away from Europe and Britain and so on and so forth that they probably had a hard time making a impact on the fact that they played a game, one called Chu Chui Wan, that was very, very much like golf. I mean, the stick was like it and they would play to a hole sometimes. So uh, the one that really influenced golf more for us though were the Roman legions. You see, they, you couldn't, fight every day up on the top. I mean, so there had to be some time off, so they were out there maybe playing Paganica, which was a Roman game. Now here's another game called Cole, C-H-O-L-E. You see this club? This is a coal club right here. It was played back in the 12 and 1300s in Belgium. They still play a game against the Belgians, against the French, and here I saw some of the little balls right here that they played with, these are wooden balls. And so it was a stick and ball game also. Why did they pick that up? Probably from the Roman legions. I mean, they had all of you, almost Europe they conquered and part of Britain. So they would watch the Romans out there getting things around and they got, well, let's try something like that. And they made their own style of game and that was a little bit different. So how about here? There you go, there's a good example. Uh, obviously, that's a stick and ball game. You've got to cheat up on some little sand right there, going for it. That would be Dutch right there. And they would even play on the ice. Uh, I don't know exactly, they didn't cut a hole in there, but there was a mark there for them to play to. This is one that's more interesting. This is called Paul Mall. Here's a Paul Mall club right here. You can use either, either side for one little higher or one a little bit lower in a ball right here. And they would play this game in the, the Britain in London, and this is the mall right here. It's a long strip of grass. Do you know when you go to the 
Gardens Mall, that's where the name came from, because Earl, our early malls were a long strip of buildings, and so they got the name Mall from it. This is a, but the target wasn't a hole, it was something to hit through a loop, and something a little, a little like a croquet kind of in a way. And there also were games, stick and ball games, where they'd hit through a loop that was hanging in the air like this, and then when they knocked it through there, then the game was over. Or a churchyard door, or a tree, or some other type. But the Scots really added the important part, and that was the digging of the hole and playing it in that fashion. Now, this is an indoor version called Kolf, K-O-L-F. Sounds a little bit like golf, doesn't it? This is a golf stick, which like you could fight with it as well as use it to play with, and a golf ball. But this was an indoor. You'd play this to a big post in the uh, uh, that was in the room. Now, this is a picture of golf, and this is a golf picture that was played at a time when they made a law against playing the game on Sunday. This picture is called the Sabbath Breakers. And uh, there is, uh, these guys are out there on the wrong day. And uh, that is, could, could mean that uh, they're probably in for more than a two-stroke penalty, okay? <laughs> there is a guy clutch, clutching the Bible and uh, saying, oh boy, you guys, are, you guys are in big trouble. Uh, the game was totally against the law in 1457, and they call it G-O-W-F, golf. And in fact, they wrote in the rules, golf, G-O-W-F and football, F-U-T-E-B-A-L-L, -L, golf and football shall be utterly cried doon, which means it was against the law. Why? Because we need our guys not out there playing these games. We need them practicing archery for self-defense. So that's basically why they did it. And then as uh, gunpowder came around finally, then it, they would bring the golf and football back. Now, uh, later, uh, this was a safety feature in golf. All golfers who on public land had to wear a red jacket to warn people that they were in the area because people could walk across the public grounds there that they were playing on. And so they would uh, all wear, they called them the red coats. And so there was, a, that was the reason for that. Now, he had a caddy back there, nice, really fat, friendly looking guy. Uh, and he's caddying, caddying with the clubs, hold, holding the clubs under his arm. That was the way they would do it before bags were invented. One fellow finally in, in St. Andrews uh, got some material, some jute, to put around, burlap, excuse me, burlap, to put around these things so you could protect the, for the grips from the weather and that, and so they would sometimes wrap burlap around, they made a, they made a tube out eventually and run there and then, and it was kind of a coincidence, I guess, that the guy that proposed that had a burlap factory. So, <laughs> anyhow, this is the guy that's there, he, now he's going to coach a little bit, and he's going to carry his caddy, but he's also the walking 19th hole. You see, he was all he was prepared to keep you well fortified. He was a retired Navy pensioner. Well, this, the approach that the Scots had to golf was rather Calvinistic, which was always kind of tough. You see, they uh, that was a kind of a tee shot that you wouldn't want to top it, you see, or you could get stuck in one of their little bunkers. <laughs> I don't know what kind of bunker, last bunker you were in, but I think Pete Dye got his idea for, you know, all the from, from, from that uh, particular time. I wouldn't want to have my 20 handicapped students in that one. Well, here were the professionals of the day. There's what they look like, all in, all in hats of some kind, and this is about the time of the first British Open, or it's not, it wasn't the British Open, it was the Open, because there was no other Open, so it wasn't the American <laughs> Open and the Spanish Open, they weren't even existing, there was only one Open, and so the proper way to refer to that tournament is as the Open Championship, because it's not the British, not to be called the British Open. Our Open didn't come until 1895, quite a bit later, and when uh, the game was played, it was played at a very difficult course up in Massachusetts. 
can, can you, oh, maybe can you read the name on this club? And uh, right there, yeah. And he's got a, it's kind of not too deep on there, but it is on there. And no, it says, it. Yeah, and it says, all your glasses, okay? Oh, we'll give it a whirl, <laughs> right there. All right, this is a club from the H. D. H. Rollins, right? Yes, H. Rollins. The winner of the first 1895 U.S. Open was Horace Rollins, right here. So it's kind of a fun, those are kind of fun little things to have. But these guys played uh, tournament golf, and when they played the Open Championship, this was a man who was so much behind. This is really the father of golf in America and England and Scotland and around the world. He was Tom Morris Sr. at St. Andrews Golf Club. Now, Morris was not just a golfer and he won the Open Championship four times, so he's a pretty good one. But he did these things as well. He was a greenskeeper. He invented top dressing with sand you, using rakes in bunkers, which were left, otherwise were just left the way they were until he put, started putting rakes in there. Aren't you happy for that? <laughs> first, he was the first to use a push motor on the greens, and he established separate team grounds from the area right by the green, and he promoted 18 holes for golf. Now, that is quite a litany of things to have accomplished. Old Tom Morris. Well, you might have noticed that I had a tie on that had an interesting picture to it, a golfer. And <laughs> I won't ask you to have to say it, George, but this is young Tom Morris. How many of you saw the movie, Tommy's Honor? Anybody here? Yes. Yeah, they made a movie about this young man. Yeah. Now, he won the, he won the Open Championship when he was 19, 20, 21. They had a huge trophy, a belt, a great huge red belt like this with a big buckle on it with a golf scene on it. And the rule was if you won the tro if you won the championship, you got to take the belt for the year. Then you give it back. Well he won it first year, gave it back. Then he won it the second year. And they gave it back. He gave it the third year. But there was another rule, and the rule said anyone who wins the three in a row gets to keep it. So now after that, the next year, they didn't have a trophy. So they didn't have an open. There was no reason. And so they went and got a new trophy. It's called the Claret Jug. And that's how the Claret Jug came to be. Who won it the first year? Tom Young Tom Morris. <laughs> the next year he died. Age 24. He died of a broken heart. As it said, he lost his wife and a baby, both. And when he was playing golf across the water over there, and they got a word over that she was good delivering and so on and so forth, and by the time they got there, we were dead. And he was dead the next year. So it was a sad story of maybe one of the greatest golfers who ever lived, for sure. So we move on. These are the young guys that worked in make, making the clubs and everything. A lot of these guys came to the United States and helped us learn the game. They came to places in New York and Boston and all the places around the East Coast and because they knew the game and they knew how to make clubs. And so making clubs was a big part of it as well. How about the ladies? You think they could play? Some, who asked me about there's gonna be ladies in this thing? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you think that's a pretty good swing? <laughs> you better believe it, yes. They could play. You're going to hear another story about famous lady in a little bit. Uh, this one was kind of interesting. This was John Daly's great great grandmother, right here. Yeah. <laughs> well, it could be. Let's, let's just say that, let's say it could be. That's for sure. Well, when uh, when did golf come to America? Hmm. It wasn't 1492. Yeah. No, but uh, I mean, even though it might have looked like it, it might have been like this, but it wasn't 1490. Yeah. Columbus didn't find this, but if he had he found this, he would have had his pearl there along to help those uh, people that he met in his first trip to this part of the world. There are several claims for the first golf course in America. 
it was thought that it was, and we'll mention him just after this, it was thought that the first organized golf played in America was in 1743 on Harleston Green, an undeveloped pasture land near the corner of Pitt and Bull Streets in Charleston, South Carolina. Anybody in South Carolina is here? You wouldn't know that probably. Charleston merchant David Dees received a shipment of 432 balls in 96 clubs and coming from Scotland and in 1786 the, the enthusiasts founded the Charleston Golf Club and so I would give them certainly credit for having their first even though they're, they, they kind of stopped for a while didn't have any golf and so on but they have now today they have a country club and uh, it would, to me, give them the, the right to call themselves the first. So, this guy, Walter Travis, came to the United States from Australia. And uh, he came in 1888. He, uh, 1897, 96, he goes to some friends over to Scotland and he sees this golfing game they got, and he, so he buys some clubs to come back to the United States. He was 35 years of age when, in three years later, he won the U.S. Amateur, 1900. And he won it in 1901. And he won it in 1903. And in 1904, Walter Travis goes to England to play in the British Amateur. Now, they had no regard, little regard, almost no regard for Americans as golfers because, hey, we didn't know anything about the game and knew what we were and so on. So when he arrived at the club, uh, there was a bit of a locker room where they put the people there that were going to play, and they gave him a spot in the hallway with a nail in the wall where he could hang his coat and put his gear and they gave him a cross-eyed caddy and they said uh, good luck you know so he wins the first match and he wins the second match and after he wins the third match they said would you like to come in the locker room and we can get you a really good caddy he said oh i'm fine where i am i i, I like my caddy it's just right well he gets to the final He's playing Ted Blackburn, a huge man. Walter Travis was five feet five, weighed about 135 or 40 pounds. And this man could out hit him by 40 yards easily, but Walter had a little secret. He could make putts from 40 feet over peanut brittle. I mean, he was an amazing, amazing putter. And so he wins this thing, 36 holes. The Brits could not believe it, not possible. And so when Lord, Lord Northbourne presented the trophy, never in the history of the British Empire have we been so utterly humiliated here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, four years later, the RNA declared this club, the Schenectady Putter, against the law because it was a mallet, a center shaft mallet. They had it outlawed, the RNA outlawed this club, not just this club, but any center shaft and a mallet club, against the law. You could not play with it in any RA event around the world until they finally rescinded it in the 1960s. But that was Walter Hagen's, excuse me, Walter Hagen. That was the putter that our guy won with. And uh, it was uh, interesting how it came to him because a friend of his had gone back to Schenectady, New York, and the guy that, that created this said, how about uh, go back, take this back and see if you'd like to uh, play with it. And when he got there, Walter Travis was there and he wanted to try it and right away he said, that's it. He said back, please make me one of those and that's what he took with him. It's a great story. Here is the first PGA champion, name of Long Jim Barnes. And, uh, Barnes won uh, in 1916, the first PGA Championship. He didn't win in 17 or 18 because there was no tournament, World War I. 
So he won again in 19. So he had back to back, 16 and 19. But this, he was a tall, he was a big tall guy, but look at that technique. Now, we're talking way a long time ago, and if that isn't as good as anything you'll see today in an impact position, I, I challenge you to be able to find it. So, here is my buddy, <laughs> Walter Hagen. <laughs> Shall I tell I own or not? <laughs> All right. My dear I own back there was, um, I had, I, I got to see her originally at a little German restaurant in Ann Arbor. And uh, she was sitting over there with her mom, and a cute girl, a nice beautiful sweater on that she knitted by the way. And uh, I was making my eyes go that direction quite a bit. And as I walked out, I uh, kind of glanced and that sort of thing. It was a Sunday afternoon in Ann Arbor. Well, we have 44,000 students there. I wasn't going to be able to see her again. But on Friday, I go to study at the uh, graduate library, and I just said, well, the graduate library was right here, but the undergraduate library was right over there. And, uh, maybe you slip over there and look around. They call it what? Trolling. Trolling, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I walked into the first floor, and you could go this way or this way on the first floor to the big study room. I'll go to the second floor, and you could go this way or that way. I went this way. I opened the door. There's that sweater and that girl. Friday night. Unbelievable. Yes. Hi, hi, my name is Gary. Hi, what's your name? I own. Oh, I own. Where are you from? Traverse City, Michigan. Is it Traverse City? That's Walter Hagen's hometown. He lived there in the summertime. Oh, Walter who? No. <laughs> oh my God. She doesn't even know who Walter Hagen is. How can I go any further in this? <laughs> but we said, let's go have a cup of coffee, and the coffee machine was broke. So Howard Johnson, and, and that was on a Friday. That was Good Friday. Sunday, Sunday, how about going to church? We went to church. Then. And uh, it went on from there. Won't go to absolutely all the rest of the story, but he was instrumental in our courtship. And we even used to celebrate his birthday when we moved to South Dakota. We put a top hat on the on the top of the table, and that top hat, and put a little Rolls Royce model car on top of it because that's the way Walter lived. He was the first man ever, first athlete in America to make a million dollars. The first one had a golf company named after him, the Walter Hagen Company. He was first in so many things. He won four match play PGA championships where you play against the best players in this country. He won four in a row. Means you got to beat like five or six guys in a row without having a bad day or them having a great day in match play. It's not like having one good round or one bad round and you still can make it. You have to be good every day. It's not, no one will ever touch that. So Walter was quite a guy. And uh, that was my first collectible. The first thing I owned as a collector was that book, The Walter Hagen Story. It was given me by the man who was running the graduate library. And uh, so I played the Walter Hagen Open in Traverse City, and I met Walter Hagen finally. And so it was, uh, believe me, uh, a great experience. One of the clubs up here is his company made. That's this one right here. You see this big pine cave face in there, right there like that? It's a sand wedge. One of the first ones that ever had a bounce to the bottom like this. See this huge bounce on the bottom? Bobby Jones won the Grand Slam with this in his bag. So it was pretty effective. The next year, the USGA outlawed it. <laughs> but they didn't outlaw it while Bobby had it, okay. <laughs> so anyway, anyway uh, here is a picture that's one of my all-time favorites. This is the 1933 Ryder Cup team. There's Walter, right there. There's Paul running over here, Gene Sarazen over here, all names that you would recognize. But how about these two guys? They're not on the team. That's the Prince of Wales. That's the Duke of York. How many saw the movie, The King's Speech? King's Speech, yeah. <laughs> well, you got him right here, see? There is the guy that had the stutter, right there. And here is the guy that saved the world. How would he save the world? It's because he abdicated. He was a Hitler sympathizer. He loved, he thought Hitler was terrific. And he wasn't gonna go after him. That might have been, we were only speaking German right now. 
But he abdicated, his brother came in, and he and Churchill were close friends, and so bam, they went after Hitler, and went, had this guy stay the prince, and not married to our nice lady up in, in Maryland, Baltimore. Well, the world might have been different. So it was a thing that changed our history. Our next picture, where there he is, folks, who is it? Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones. Wow. <coughs> what can you not say about Bobby Jones? I mean, there are so many things you can talk about and tell about Jones. Uh, one of the things, I was sitting with Joe Dye at dinner up in Pinehurst, at the hotel there. I'm always Joe Dye. You may remember Joe Dye. Yeah. He was the head of the USDA and then later the first tour commissioner and so on, PGA tour. He was a great man in golf, the highest respected golf person in the United States. We're having to get, a, get dinner together, and he got talking about Bobby Jones. And this is what he said Gary, Bob Jones was a great man who just happened to play golf. What a, what a wonderful thing to say. Yes, uh, but I have a quote that Jones made one time, which I think you'll find very interesting. And it's this one. He said, before the 1930 British Amateur Championship, he said, they had a chance to uh, go out and play with a particular person in a practice round. And it was the old course at St. Andrews with a lady whose name was Joyce Weatherin. Joyce Weatherin, right there. And both played off the back tees, all the way back. And after Weatherin putted on the 18th hole and made a 75, from the back tees, Jones said this, quote, I have not played golf with anyone, man or woman, amateur or professional, who made me feel so utterly outclassed. <laughs> so there is another one for you right there for the ladies in this program. Believe me, we appreciate it. Well, <coughs> look at this one. <coughs> This is the first radio broadcast of a PGA Tour event. <laughs> it got quite an, a little uh, device to carry the <laughs> transmitter around. Can you tell me what the station was? Where it was? Minnesota. And what time? Huh? Minnesota. That's correct. St. Paul, KSTT. Right. Yay, got one. And uh, so consequently, uh, that particular, <laughs> that gives you a little idea about uh, how we got started in broadcast. <laughs> But that's a good one. Here's another one. Our first golf cart. Yeah, right. That was a little tough on the, around the golf course, I would think. But, and there was only one of these made, actually. We can see his clubs on there. I, I think maybe there was an earlier one than that. But, well, maybe not quite that one. But uh, the, real, the real first one, the real first golf cart was this one. It was called the Arthritis Special. And it was made for Mr. W, I mean, J.K. Wadley. Mr. Wadley was from Texarkana, Texas, and he was a very wealthy man in the lumber business and railroad and oil, and, uh, but he couldn't play golf anymore because of his arthritis, and so they came up with this device, and subsequently now, we have millions of golfers that ride rather than walk. And that is kind of unfortunate. You know, I, I try to tell people, I, I know you're playing in a foursome and there are two cards there. You can make a deal, okay? So you say, I'll tell you, at least do this. I'll walk the odd holes and you and ride and, and drive the even holes, okay? So at least you get nine holes of walking. Uh, or there, I sometimes tell people, uh, you know, my doctor won't let me ride because it's hard on my back or something like that. And uh, so I want to get as much uh, out of the game as I can, and part of it is exercise. And that's been one of the things from the beginning, and it's kind of, well, some people can't play, play unless they have a cart. That's, at least you're playing, that's okay. But uh, if you could play, play without it, or partly, I would suggest that for your fitness. 
Here is why we don't want our kids riding in cars all the time. <laughs> See, uh, you might end up, uh, if you start like this, you might end up like this. Now, this is, this is a device for the corporal involver. <laughs> and and uh, what it is, is I think they should have had it for William Howard Taft. Because Taft was our first golfing president. And he weighed 330 pounds. And when he put the ball where he could see it, he couldn't hit it. And where he put it where he could hit it, he couldn't see it. So, so uh, that's just an example. And uh, another idea about fitness, you know, take, take your care of yourself out there. Well, you could do this. You could, you could do this also. That, that, would, that would give you a, a little bit of exercise. Uh, who is it, by the way? Who's Guy? W.C. Fields, you got it right. Do you know what his real name was? <coughs> How many knew or heard of W.C. Fields? Certainly, just all of them. Well, here's his real name. William Claude Duncan Fields. <laughs> Not quite as exciting as W.C. Fields. <laughs> That's what happens when you go to Hollywood. Uh, now we're gonna have some audience participation. When you know the name, of the person I'm flipping up here. Shout it out. You ready? Here we go. Babe Ruth. Right. Babe Ruth. And he loved his golf. That's right. I was in with Babe in 1947 in Billings, Montana, at a New York Legion baseball tournament. How they got it from New York to New England, I have no idea. But I was 12 years old and a bat boy on a little, on a great um, junior Legion team. All right, who is it? It's a Churchill. Right. So, can you give me the first one when you said Babe Ruth? Do you know his real name? What was Babe Ruth's real name? George. 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 Herman. Ruth. Junior. Yeah, even Junior. That was a tough part. How about uh, Churchill? What was his full name? Ooh. Winston, Winston. 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 Leonard Spencer Churchill. That was a tough one. Yeah. They did not expect you to get that one. Now, I'm at Trump, and I'm talking to a person on the range, and he said, I, I've got a guest coming. And I said, oh yeah, back there he comes. He says, coming down the hill right there. Here's this guy coming down, ruddy face, white hair flowing. I mean, just a really active, like, looking guy. It's amazing. I just, I'm impressed right away looking at him. And so he comes down, and I said, hi, I'm Gary Waring. He said, hi, I'm Winston Churchill. <laughs> he was Winston's grandson. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, we lost him uh, too early, but that was quite an interesting. I said, well, you know, I have a uh, picture of your grandpa playing golf. He said, no, he didn't play golf. I said, well, I have a picture of him playing golf. And he said, well, he didn't play golf. So I got the picture and I got a copy and sent over to him in Palm Beach. And uh, the fact is, a matter, he played very, very little, but when you go down to Song Pours or somewhere down on the coast, he'd play four or five bowls and that sort of thing, but he was busy with other things. Mm -hmm. All right, who is it? <laughs> Hi, yes, what, what's the full name? Dwight, 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 Dwight. David. All right, Dwight David Eisenhower. <coughs> he was playing a burn, burning tree uh, a lot. That was it's an all man's course that was right outside of Washington. How many have played burning tree? Anybody here? Yeah, okay, great great course, right? Yeah, very private, right? Yep. Yeah, and uh, it's kind of one of those places where you can tell the members from the guests. Because the guests go into the woods to take a leave. And, and, and not the members. All right, now here we go. This is, uh, you got the name, Dwight David Eisenhower, and President Eisenhower was playing an 18th hole, a burning tree. Up to the last hole, the bets were all on, and he was, uh, he doesn't like, he didn't like to lose. Yeah. So he did his drive in the right rough. He's got a caddy there, and he looks at the drive, and it's sitting in the rough, long, the grass was really long, and he kind of taps his club down behind it a little bit, you know, maybe a little help a little bit, and the ball falls down even deeper. <laughs> And he says, Mo, what's going on here? He said, Mr. President, I just figured you over improved your life. <laughs> that was, all right, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Gene, Gene Sarazen. 
What was his real name? Once he, he won his first tournament and he saw his name in the paper and he didn't like it. Eugenio Saracini. And that was his real name. He changed it at that point and he became Gene Saracini. He was only 5'5", five, five, tough little Italian guy. He was a very, very good player. What was his full name? Just what I said. No middle name, Eugenio Saracini. Who is it? Sam. Yes, yes. Sam, Sam Sneed. What was his middle name? Oh, what you know what his middle name was? Samuel Jackson. Jackson. You got it. Here's a real scholar over here. Samuel Jackson Sneed. Got the uh, Sam had uh, Sam was quite an interesting guy to be around. You know, he was they called it double jointed because he was so flexible. And one of the things he used to do is a stunt when he went to the the Masters Past Champions Dinner, he would do one of his old stunts that he would do. He could kick the top of a door jam with his foot. I mean, unbelievable. And so I was, I was always noted for that. Well, this one year he didn't come because he was ill, he was getting older. They didn't know if he'd be anymore or not. And so the following year, he, here they hear he is coming. And Gary Player is in with the rest of the people rest of the people that have arrived so far. And Gary says, you know, really bad, too bad about Sam, isn't it? And they said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you can't, you know, all the things he used to be able to do is getting too old and all that sort of thing. So Sam shows up. So one of the guys says, hey, Sam, bet you 200 you can't kick the top of the door jam. Wham, here, 100 for you, Gary, and 100 for me. <laughs> 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 yeah, We've had, I would have spent a lot of time with uh, Sam on the Golf Digest panel with Milkoff, Runyon, Snead, and John Jacobs, and great stories. Who is it? Nicholas. Yeah, that's uh, when his son sees that. That's my daddy before he was pretty, he says. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, Jack Nicholas, what's his middle name? He's like me, his parents couldn't afford a middle name, so he's just Jack Nicholas, <laughs> I'm just Gary Player. Okay, that's no middle name. Now there's Jack's wonderful book. I mean, this was a really good book, Golf My Way. But uh, there was a friend I met later, a golfer in Chicago, named Gus Bernardoni. And Gus was in the military, he was a paratrooper, and he came out of an airplane in, during wartime, came down, and his chute did not open fully. And he's coming down like a rock. And, you know, what do you do? And he fortunately hit some big soft trees and more of him, I don't know, the haystack or whatever, but he isn't killed. And when he gets to down there, he says, I'm going to devote my life to God's work. He became a golf professional, but he did all kinds of things for it. And he wrote a book. And so Barbara Nichols is in my office at PGA. And I have this book called My Way right up at sightline as she leaves and I said, Barb, I've got Jack's book here. And I said, it's really a terrific book. She said, thank you very much. I said, but I have to go to a higher authority. I have to go to Mr. Bernardoni's book. Whoop, back, come on. <laughs> Golf guys first. No, that was all just in fun, of course. She took it as a good gist. So uh, this next player, what's the name? <laughs> Come on, Tommy Armour, don't you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, okay, that was kind of sick. But... All right, so here is, uh, I'm going to again challenge you with some modern players. Ready? Real quickly now. Uh, Chi Chi Rodriguez. Right, Chi Chi Rodriguez, you got it right. Chi Chi's up the, over this butt. He can't read the green. Uh, he, I mean, he just says, I can't see. Does it go to the left or does it go to the right? His caddy's by him. He said, look, it always breaks toward the ocean. Yeah, he said, but which one, Atlantic or Pacific? <laughs> <laughs> All right, who is it, who is it? Arnie, Arnie, oh man. He was the king and never acted like one. Uh, that's so true. We've had some nice, we've had some times with Arnie. We were in Hawaii. No, was it Hawaii? No, we weren't in Hawaii. We were in Orlando. And Arnie and Kit is, was there. Kit was his new second wife. And we were at a private home and there was eight people there. 
we were sitting having a drink, and uh, someone, one of them said, hey, Arne, tell Gary and I own about your marriage, about getting married. And Arne says, you tell her, kid. And the uh, kid says, oh, you tell him, Arne. And finally, the kid, kid ends up doing it. And she said, well, we went to Hawaii. We were on the main island, and we were up on the end of it there, quite a ways outside of town. And Arne comes to me and says, we've been living in sin. And uh, Arne says, hey, kid, you want to get married? What? She says, yeah, let's get married while we're here. Uh, she said, you really? He said, yeah, you line up a minister or whatever can do the ceremony and get a marriage license, and let's do it. And so she said, okay. So they get in. It's Friday. The civic offices are closed on Saturday. So they have go in Saturday, but there's some private people that still can do marriage licenses. So they go in to this Japanese way lady, knock on the door, she opens, also, you know, come please. And she gives uh, papers to Arnie, and she gives the papers to Kit to fill out for the marriage license. Kit's doing hers, and the lady comes over and says, do you know who you're marrying? <laughs> <laughs> so there's no problem with that. Yeah, I got a good idea. Who is it? Who is it? Gary Player is correct. Gary, Gary is my friend and co-promoter of fitness for PGA Golf Professional. He takes care of the tour and I've always tried to do it for the club professional. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many guys, for example, I do all kinds of things to try to stay fit. And one of them, the, the guys have come up to me 30 years later and said, I still do that. And one of them, when I get up in the morning, and the first thing is toothbrush, I put the put the toothpaste on it, and I, I brush my teeth going like this. And I do a hundred of those squats every morning, and at night I do one-legged rise on toast. So, brushing, because you brush morning and night, I hope. So that's a reg regularity kind of thing, and here has been so good, and he, he can do things I can't even begin to do, but he's a, he's a great person for golf. All right, tell me, now, tell me the, what you're gonna tell me on this, as we run through these, you're gonna tell me the name of the tournament. What's the tournament? The Masters. The Masters, right, there we go. Hey, I don't know if you know about it, but uh, what's the famous street they go down? Magnolia. Magnolia Lane, here's a picture of it. A long time ago. <laughs> this is Magnolia Lane. Uh, when it was Berkman's Nursery, and back in the 18, late 1800s and on to there. And uh, so uh, this was the early, but Masters didn't start until 1934. And uh, this was the huge crowds that they would have when they first started. <laughs> they would give away tickets, $5 tickets, or you could, oh, we'll give it to you. Because they didn't have many people that uh, went to it. But they, during the war, that was Augusta National. <laughs> That's they did. They had cattle on the course eating because it was closed and so they were doing this at that point. Ah yes. And here are four great four of the great players. There's Bobby Jones, Gene Saracen, Walter Hagen, Tommy Arnold. Now uh, one comment up there uh, in the in the early masters. As you can see there again how Gene Searson is not very big. But when you go over to Walter, he did more for professional golf than any golfer in history. Because Walter was such a figure, and he was the first athlete in the world to make a million dollars of any athlete. He was uh, he he played with princes and kings and Everybody. He was such had such a great personality, but at that time, golf professionals were not allowed in the clubhouse of a private club until Walter changed that. Walter made it so that in 1920 he was able to get this to happen. The Sylvester Pierre Germain he lobbied the USGA in 1920 for allowing pros to come into the clubhouse. And that was for a U.S. Open. And both parties agreed, and Inver Inverness is where it was held, became the first club in the United States, Inverness in Toledo, to allow pros in the clubhouse. 
Now, as a gift for that, Walter gathered all of the PGA pros the next time they played in Inverness, and they gave the club a beautiful, large grandfather clock. And still, when you go in, the, go in the first door, the front door of the of Inverness Golf Club, you open it up, and there is this beautiful clock. And this is what it says on the bottom. Nice plate. God measures men by what they are, not by what they in wealth possess. This vibrant message chimes afar the voice of Inverness. So it was really a wonderful kind of one of those spe special little stories. The uh, we're going to move on now to tournaments. Where is what is the tournament? Where is the What's the tournament? The US Open. Right, U.S. Open. And the golf club, you know anything about the golf club? What was it? A two, two iron. A one iron? A one iron? Yes, a one iron. And what happened to it? It was stolen out of Ben Hogan's locker along with his shoes at the end of that tournament, and he didn't see it again for 36 years. Someone found it in a strange place, and he took it to Ben, and Ben said, that's it, that's it. So this is the most famous picture in all of history of golf from a playing standpoint. And it's strange that there, that would happen, that that would be uh, an item that was sold. All right, what is the tournament? The Open Championship. The Open Championship, <coughs> right. The, when when um, you become the captain of the RNA, you must play yourself into office by hitting a tee shot with everybody around to now you're officially the captain. Well, years ago, when they do this, they used to always, and they still do to this day, give a gold sovereign, something worth a considerable amount of money in the old days, to the caddies who stood out in the first fairway, who captured the one who got it, got to turn it in and get a gold sovereign. Well, when one of the early Prince of Wales came and was going to be the captain, he stood there and he looked out, and the caddies were unflatteringly close to the team. <laughs> and and uh, there's always been kind of a famous story about how they didn't give him much credit for being able to hit it far. So one of our United States people, after Bob Jones, who was a captain, the next one was George Bush, senior. George Walker, Herman Walker Bush. He was the captain of the RNA. And he had to play himself in. <coughs> I wrote a book called When Golf is a Ball. It's all about stories, things that I've been, where I've been, the things that I've done. And in there is this story. It's the story of what I just told you, of playing in and the Prince of Wales having that experience. I sent a copy to Mr. President Bush, he was former President Bush, and he told me, he wrote me a note back, and he said, you won't believe this. I took the book and I opened it up and the first thing I saw was the story of the prince playing himself in, and believe me, I know how he felt. <laughs> and so it was it a very special thing. Oh, what's the tournament? Come on. Western Open. Everybody should know that. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay, what's this one? Ah, the Canadian Open. You always should know that, right? All right. Well, by the way, when how many Canadians in here? I apologize. Okay. I love Canada. Here we go. When you played in the snow in St. Andrews, or in Canada, and it was a light snow, and you're still out there playing, well, that's pretty heavy, you played with a red ball <coughs> because you couldn't see a white ball. And in St. Andrews, in the spring, they had daisies in the, in the rough. Daisies are what color? White. Yes, and so they played red ball in the spring and when it snowed. So if you ever see a red ball like that, that's the reason why. Why we're talking about balls, before I forget this one. This is a facsimile of a feather. That's the ball that was played up until 1850. They played with the long nose clubs like this. Those long nose clubs were made in this fashion. That's what they started with, a piece of wood that looked like that. And then they would cut to this shape, and then they would take that and they would lay they would lay the shaft underneath, glue it, and then they would whip it. 
That was called, when you put string around it, it was called whipping. So that's the way they would do it in those days. Now they were playing with a feathery golf ball. Feathery? Yes, they played with these since 1500. Leather covered, this is a facsimile, because they're worth about four or $5,000 and I don't want to lose it. But uh, there, you took two strip, two little circular pieces of leather, and then you took a strip around like that, and then the ball maker would boil uh, feathers and get them boiled heavily. Then they would soak the leather, and then he would start, leave a little hole open, and he would start stuffing the feathers in. And he had a little tool that was on his chest, and he'd push, push, push. A lot of ball makers become, became pigeon-breasted. And a lot of them died of consumption because breathing the floating feathers in the air. Yes, but they, you could only make about four a day. So the ball was very expensive. That's why the limit was on what you had to have some money to play golf. And so the ball became, when the, when the gutter percher ball came, the rubber ball that came out in 1848, now you can make, this, how many molds do you have? You can make 20 balls a day or whatever. And therefore the price of golf went down tremendously. And people, that's when the golf, the big boost to getting golf being played. So this ball, when the feathers dried, they, they expanded. And when the leather dried, it compressed. And so they could hit this ball 175 to 180, 200 yards on a really good shot. Hard to believe. How much feathers? That many. A top hat, I got full of feathers went in this ball. Last little comment on the feathering. If you wanted the ball to fly high, you put in goose feathers. And when you wanted to fly low, you put in chicken feathers. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> All righty, we're moving along now from Canada to where? Where are they? Where are we? Arizona. Arizona. Right. Name the state. There we go. What's the state? California. California. Bevel. Right. Not Bevel. Cypress. Okay. What's the state? Right, Pine Valley, got it, New Jersey. Good one, George. Okay, what's the state? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, what do they call this? Church pews. The what? Church pews. Church the church pews, exactly right. All right, what's the state? It happens to be Florida, and it happens to be Trump International. We <laughs> haven't been there. That's a 10th P right up here going up along there. And then the, 16 coming in for that room. Anyhow, it's, if you haven't been there, it's absolutely gorgeous golf course. All right, I'm gonna, I got a trick picture here. This is a little tougher. Yeah, a little tougher. Because it isn't what's the state, it's what's the country, Japan. What's the mountain? Fuji. 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 Yeah, correct, Mount Fuji. I taught golf in Japan for 17 years, so I saw a lot of action over there and had a TV show, and uh, so I got around quite a bit, and. Uh, I love Japanese golf students because they never would argue with you. Well, I'm not going to change my grip. You know, that guy from Texas. No, I like this right here. And they just said, I saw it, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you tell them to grip it upside down. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, anyhow, here's a tough one also. This is almost a trick. This happens to be the most exclusive golf club in the world. What state? California. What's the course? It's called Sunnyland. It was the course owned by Walter Annenberg, and it was called the, actually, was called the Camp David of the West. It had more presidents, Eisenhower, every president played there, and even when Dick Nixon, President Nixon was out, had to go out of office, this is a note he wrote. When you are down, you find out who your real friends are. We shall always be grateful for your kindness and your loyal friendship. And that was written to the owners of the course because they were certainly good friends with Richard Nixon. Okay. Um, Just curious, where is the 
in California. What's new? Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I, I'm glad you asked me that because it's one thing I didn't write down. <laughs> but is this uh, too rich? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, here are things, folks. Let's have a little more fun. Physical gyrations which will not affect the flight of a ball. No matter how dramatic they may be, such as the behind the back move, or kicking in the cup, or the ant's eye view of the putt. None of those are really that good. And there are things you shouldn't try if you are a golfer. Number one, like bungee jumping, tiger, Tiger, that's Tiger Woods down in Australia or New Zealand. I know my boss, when I worked with, uh, as a consultant with Tommy Armour Company, Bob McNally once said, I have no interest in having a person working minimum wage who is preparing me for a potential life ending activity. <laughs> yeah. All right, here's something you don't want to do. That's, that, that's a little too deep to try to get it out there. Now, even uh, in trying to get it out there, uh, was a guy named Woody Austin. This is in the America's Cup, and uh, President's Cup. It was at Royal Montreal. And he got through it, but the action caused him to lose his balance. And he went down, he went. And it was a very memorable. He lost the hole, but he birdied the next three. He had a half a point for the hot. I was pretty tough. So the uh, thing that he did, which was very clever, and the next day when he came out of the locker room, he came out like this, <laughs> which was very clever. Now, now here's a lesson all golfers should learn. The golf can cause moments of disappointment. So, you know, you hit it in that, that's a little bit, uh, a little bit tough, right? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, that wouldn't be any fun, for sure. Yeah, right, yeah, you know, Michelle, I didn't like that shot. Oh, geez, and there's Tiger saying, oh, God, another one out of bounds. Um, and my ball is buried, Danica, my ball is buried in the bunker. And uh, Colin Montgomery, oh, geez, the third best short putt, and Retief Goosen. That drive is a stinker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but Tom Watson, Tom Watson, 2009, what was the tournament? The Open Championship. Tom Watson, 59 years of age. The oldest person ever to win the Open was Tom Morris, old Tom Morris, at age 47. So here's Tom Watson, 59 years of age, coming to the 18th hole, only needing a par to win and become a six-time champion, tying Harry Garden for the most open title. It was a chance to be more than just a golf celebrity. It was a chance to be monumental, to win that. So what does he do? He really has it zoned in. He hits a perfect drive right down the middle. It's 168 yards to the flag. He takes an eight iron, because you don't want to be long, could be a little short, not so bad. He hits it perfectly. He hits the front right side of the green, which happened to have a little kind of a mound there. It hits that spot, the ball rolls across the green into some rough behind. Now he's got to decide if to chip it or to put it. And then the last hole, he put it out of the rough to save a par. So that's probably why he chose the putter. <coughs> he goes over and makes an attempt not too good, six feet from the hole. He misses the putt. Now he's got to go in a playoff. Stewart sink. They play into the get into the playoff, and Tom has lost it. it is, he has no more energy to go. Stewart's play is fine, and it's over. The chance to be immortal, literally, has kind of just disappeared. Now, literally every golf fan in the world wanted Tom Watson to win. I mean, everybody. And so we, uh, you say, well, what, what does it have to do with this? Well, this is a birthday card that we sent to Warren Buffett, okay? And, and the dolly is so much like Warren, see? Yeah, wow, I think this is what I always wanted. Take care of this. But Warren sent it back. 
And he wrote this on the back of the card. Hi, I am Gary. I love this card. This guy actually looks like me. <laughs> and he has my philosophy, which means I don't want things. I don't want things. We'll get down here. And he says, I sure wish Tom Watson had sunk that putt. <laughs> we know when you uh, see, I can't read that, but that's the point. He wished he had sunk that putt, Warren. Well, okay, oh yeah, let me know when you're in Omaha. Okay, so uh, I sent a letter to Tom, and this is a letter he wrote back to me, because I congratulated on the way he handled that disappointment. He walked, he had to take a press <coughs> conference after the game he had just lost his all opportunity to get more. He's got to walk in with some guys now asking him questions. Why did you miss that putt on the Why didn't you chip it instead of whatever? The first thing he says is, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a funeral. Yeah. And I really clapped him. And then he goes through that whole time and with all that pain. And so this is what Tom sent back to me. Dear Gary, many thanks for the kind words and so on. But you get to the part here, and he says, the game of golf can be the most beautiful, the shot that he hit was beautiful, and cruelest in the same shot, because that ball bounced like you shouldn't believe. But that's the game, isn't it? All my best, it's early time. A great, great, I'll tell you, what, what a response to a very, very serious, depth, almost uh, something would de definitely, definitely be a, terrible thing to handle. Well, uh, here, is, here is a dream that you may have. It's more like a nightmare. You're going out to play golf. That's what you have to do. Well, it's not really a, you know, something that isn't there. That's the same thing right here, almost, you see? The 18th hole Augusta, you gotta shoot through a thing that looks like that. Believe me, golf can be a little challenging that way. So what is the, Tall, long, the long and short of the answers to this game. Well, that's Carol Mann there. She's in the World of Golf Hall of Fame, wonderful woman. But to be a very good golfer, it takes some strength, not this much strength, that's a long ride. Then. Takes some flexibility. Well, not that much flexibility, that's quite a bit. And it takes a solid technique. There is a solid technique. And what are the answers? Well, I tried to put those answers into this book, 619 page book that wrote 1990 came out, the teaching man, BJ teaching man. And in that, we covered all of those kinds of subjects. Now, Prime Minister Abbey was here last week. So I got him on the range. I had the PGA teaching man on my arm. And I asked him if he would sign the book for me, which he did. And then I opened it. It's in Japanese. Oh. It, was, it was a Japanese translation of that book, which uh, was kind of, he appreciated very much. And that's kind of that was something that came out with Hagar when, and this when we were doing the main. Okay, we're getting ready to wrap up here. There is my friend Dennis Walters, a paraplegic golfer who was given 3,000 golf shows. He's one of my heroes. He has a little dog, Bucky, with him. Yeah. And Dennis uh, is just, he had an, auto, an accident in a golf cart. Flipped over on him, he became a paraplegic that day. And when he went to the hospital and one of the young men that was treated, working with him said, Dennis, you know, you're never gonna play golf again. He said, you play golf? He was on the hospital bed. You play golf? The guy said, yeah. He said, what do you shoot? He said, about 105. He said, you wouldn't know. And uh, Dennis lives on this theme. If you have dreams, live them. And that's what he's done. How about Tommy McAuliffe? The armless, armless wonder. Yes, Tommy McAuliffe was the world champion armless golfer. Tommy was born in 1893 in Buffalo and the oldest of five children. His arms were amputated after being run over by a train in 1902. He was left with no arms, not even stumps. He learned to write by holding a pencil in his mouth. 
He was the president of his senior class. He attended three years of college. He married 1919, father of four children, 16 grandchildren. He became a caddy of a nearby golf course using an old discarded club. He learned to play by holding the club between his neck and shoulder. He became so good, he won the caddy tournament. After finishing college, Tommy was encouraged by his brother Walter, a professional golfer, to start his own vaudeville act in New York. So he's played with all the great players in the world. And his average score was 92, and Tommy became the world champion, and his lowest score was not 85. Holding the club that way. All right, we're going to wrap this now and get to at least give you 10 minutes to ask some questions. But golf can provide some of the most beautiful settings you can imagine. It is a beautiful game. That's the, my favorite picture of all time, Monterey Peninsula. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ion's friend took the picture, very nice. Not only is it a beautiful game, but it's a game where you can have a lot of joy, a lot of fun. Whether you're a professional golfer, somebody who just won a tournament, or you're an average golfer this time and have a good time. You can start when you're very young. You can play till you're very old. Who are they? Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. In their 90s, still playing golf. <clears throat> golf is a game you can fall in love with. It's easy to fall in with. You can start very young, and you can play for a long time. But someday there will be a last round. And when that time comes, you will look back on your life that contained golf, and you will find that one of the greatest rewards that you receive by simply playing it. So there's a number of people that the greatest reward is the people that you meet and the friendships that you make. Bob Ford on the right here, uh, one of our local great professionals. And so there we are, friendship. All right, we're gonna stop now and answer a couple questions and I'm gonna give you one last slide before we leave. So question time. Yes. Why is the game 18 holes? Because what happened, it was, first of all, it was 12 holes someplace. It depends on the amount of land that was available. They played 12, 9, 7, whatever, there was land. And then St. Andrews came up with 24 holes. And they was cut down to 18, which we have now, and they made double greens. And so St. Andrews was kind of the leading place, so everybody copied St. Andrews. 18. It's too many. Should be twelve. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Another question. Question. Yes. What's the likelihood that uh, some of uh, Nicholas's ideas uh, get accepted and the uh, pressure on golf balls be reduced to the point where the bowl course is just going wrong? Yeah. Well, Jack has talked for a long time because the ball's going too far and great courses now are making it too easy. We're used to either driver in the three wood or having a driver in the seven iron. And a lot of people who play the game think that this should be changed. It's called bifurcation. If you let them make play a ball that will go as far, and you can play the ball that goes farther. And that I think that's going to be a hard sell. So Jack's preached that for 20 years. I preached it along with him, and I, we've never gotten anywhere. Got it. Okay. One more, yeah. Other than uh, on the island of Bermuda, I don't think the pros wear Bermuda. Do you think that just as the tie eventually left golf, that the long pants will and Bermudas will be played with by our professionals? Well, people, first of all, when I come dressed like this, when I come dressed like this, people say, oh, you've got knickers on. I said, no, I don't. They said, well, I thought they called those knickers. No, knickers came to your kneecap. When you add four inches from the kneecap, it becomes a plus four. And that's, that's where they got the name, the plus four. Okay, let's finish up. Let's finish up. My all time good friend, Harvey Payne. Quick story on how humble he was. Most humble man I've ever met, absolutely. His son has found him these big red folder with all these notes and ideas in it. That Harvey has collected over the years, and he said, Dad, why don't you write a book? Uh, nobody wanted to read a book by me, you know, kind of thing. He said, Dad, you don't have to write it. We'll get a writer. You just tell him all these things, and we'll make a nice book. 
So they're sitting in Harvey's kitchen, little with Helen, his wife's over here. Harvey's sitting there, kind of bent over. There's a New York attorney, a uh, publishing attorney, and then there's the guy that's going to write the book, Bud Trick. That's right, Bud Trick. And so the re the attorney is talking about term, liability, and all that's going over Harvey's head. And he pushes the contract over to Harvey. He said, Mr. Pennick, if you'll sign that right there, it'll be a $50,000 advance. I'm sorry, I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> That's what you call humility. Uh, now, one more quick Harvey one. My own, own and I are at the American Junior Golf Association, AJGA, annual dinner at PGA National. These are all the best players, junior players in the United States, and many from other parts of the world who come to play here. The, the number one, the player of the year has been Bill Mickelson, for example, uh, and some of the great players we have out there right now. So these are the, the cream of the crop. And it's a, a night that I own and enjoy more than any other we have because it's so uplifting to see these kids and how smart they are, grade point average, 4.3, 4.5, and how well-spoken they are. And what they some of them say, you know, I give this, my heart to Jesus Christ or whatever else or I give for my folks or whoever. Credit. So anyhow, we we walk in and the, we can't go in yet, the doors are shut, so there's a little foyer out there, people are having a little lemonade or whatever. And there are two people standing there, a man and woman, about in their I'd say late seventies, mid seventies. They're just standing there like that. Nobody's talking to them. And so I walk over, to be friendly, and I said, Hi, my name's Gary, where are you folks from? They said, Austin, Texas. <laughs> Austin, Texas, am I? That's the home of my all-time favorite hero, teacher, everything, human being, Harvey Pennant. They said, yes, yes. I said, matter of fact, I just heard a story about Harvey that I didn't know before. It was four months before he died. And he was told at the club, at Austin Country Club, that he would, if he wanted to, could go over to a course nearby where they were holding a senior women's amateur tournament. And he probably taught a bunch of those ladies when they were 16 years old. So he agreed, he would go over. So they take a cart and pull it up by the range. So he's back there and the women are hitting and they look back and see Harvey and he's sitting on the driver's side. They go over, oh Harvey, we love you, nice to see you, all this sort of thing. And then a lady comes up, so almost time to tee off, but she hurries up there. And she sees him and she takes his hand and says, Harvey, I love you so much. You're so wonderful, etc." And finally she says, Harvey, I have to go play golf now. She takes two steps and he says, Margaret, Margaret, get, get back here. Get back here. So she comes back and he takes her hand and he says, Margaret, you don't have to go play golf. You get to go. Like, this is not a right, it's a privilege, folks. It's not a right, it's a privilege. And then I look at the lady, and the lady looks at me, and she says, Gary, I'm Margaret. <laughs> Can you believe that? I get goosebumps every time I think about it. And it's such a wonderful story. So leaving my great friend Harvey, we close with this item. I'm going to read it as you look at it. What will matter? This is our close. Ready or not, someday it will all come to an end. There will be no more sunrises, no minutes, hours, or days. All the things you collected, whether treasured or forgiven, forgotten, will pass to someone else. Your wealth, fame, and temporal power will shrivel to irrelevance. It will not matter what you owned or what you were owed. Your grudges, resentments, frustrations, and jealousies all will finally disappear. So too, your hopes, your ambitions, your plans, and to-do lists will expire. The wins and losses that once seemed so important will fade away. 
It won't matter where you came from or what side of the tracks you lived on at the end. It won't matter whether you were the beautiful or brilliant, and even your gender and skin color will be irrelevant. So what will matter? How will the value of your days be measured? What will matter is not what you bought, but what you built. Not what you got, but what you gave. What will matter is not your success, but your significance. What will matter is every act of integrity, compassion, courage, or sacrifice that enriched, empowered, or encouraged others to emulate your, emulate your example. What will matter is not your competence, but your character. What will matter is how many people you knew, not how many you knew, but how many will feel a lasting loss when you are gone. What will matter is not your memories, but the memories of those who loved you. What will matter is how long you will be remembered, by whom and for what. Living a life that matters doesn't happen by accident. It's not a matter of circumstance, but of choice. Choose to live a life that matters. I can't think of a better way to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can put the lights on back there. We get more light on this right here. And uh, that's it. Okay, you can come on up and look.